And to keep to our strict hour time limit, I'm going to immediately start by introducing our first uh, speaker of electron distribution fame, uh, Bart Ruperta of the Flatiron Institute slash Princeton. So take it away. Thanks Richard uh, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. Um, here we go. Can you see it properly and can you hear me properly? Great. Yes, I can. Yes. All right. Um, right. Uh, so I'll, I'll go straight to the matter um, because I have eight minutes. So um, we know that, uh, that flares have been observed from Sagittarius A star for the past maybe 15 to 20 years. And recently the gravity interferometer even observed like a, like a coherent uh, hotspot orbiting. Um, and uh, the, uh, the origin of these flares is, uh, is as of yet still, still unknown. Um, so gravity, for example, observed variable non-thermal infrared and x-ray emission and a day conjecture among other people um, that reconnection is, is uh, the mechanism that powers these uh, flares. We know that uh, reconnection forms plasmoids in certain regimes, so, so blobs of plasma. And those blobs of plasma consist of um, energetic electrons that, uh, that radiate. Um, from gravity, we know that the emission region of such a hotspot is typically like uh, of the order of one uh, Schwarzschild radii. Um, so I indicated this, for example, in the M87 image with this, with this arrow here. But we also know that this plasma is, is collisionless, as, as Elliot Quattert nicely explained on the first day of this conference. Um, and that the typical electron gyro radius is about 10 to the minus 11 Schwarzschild radii in the case of Sagittarius A star. So you see that there are many, many orders of magnitude difference between the global dynamics of such a hotspot and the electrons that actually power the, the flaring. Um, so there is an extreme scale separation that we have to overcome and that's very hard uh, to do in theory and, uh, and, and in the observations. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how we try to do it with, uh, with modern uh, day uh, simulations. So can we model reconnection in GRMHD? The answer is yes. Um, here you see like a zoom in into a reconnection layer uh, around a black hole and you see that, that practically everything we need is anti-parallel magnetic field. The magnetic field forms, uh, forms an X point where, where the two, where two field lines sort of change topology and they, they reconnect and there is an outflow in the horizontal direction. Um, the question is of course, how large uh, and are these type of current sheets in a black hole accretion flow and where do they originate, et cetera. Um, we know in, global, in local box simulations that we can, uh, we can uh, reproduce this phenomenon. And, and here you also see what I mentioned before. Uh, this is a resistive GRMHD simulation by PhD student Sebastian Salvi from University of Amsterdam. Um, and you see that plasmoids form and that they, that they uh, start to advect and merge and they form uh, larger box sized uh, structures. So the question is, does this happen in global simulations? Um, because there these plasmoids could power the flares. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that for plasmoids to form, you need to have a Lundquist number, which is practically one over resistivity of 10 to the four and higher. I, I cannot go into details here why that is the case, but you have to trust me on this or ask me afterwards in the, on Slack. Um, but it means that the resistivity is, is typically very small um, and, and, and we need to resolve these small uh, scales. Um, that for that you need high resolution, whether this resistivity is numerical or explicit or physical, you definitely need high resolution to do so. Um, so in 2D, we manage resistive GRMHD simulations with a Lundquist number of 10 to the 10 to the five. So the resistivity was really uh, well below the plasmoid limit. Um, this is a magnetically arrested disk simulation, um, but we need a resolution of, of about 6,000 by 3,000 cells, which is, which is already extremely expensive in 2D even. But then you see that close to the event horizon here, uh, current sheets form and they become plasmoid unstable as you've seen in the local box simulation that I showed before. And more intriguingly in the middle panel, uh, you see that if those plasmoids form and they manage to escape the gravitational pull that they can actually move, uh, uh, merge to large uh, hot structures, which you see here moving along the jet and into the disk. Um, so these hot structures can account for like limb brightening of the jet. And if they stay coherent, they can actually form a hotspot as, as has been observed by gravity. Now, the main question is of course, like 
what happens in 3D, because in 2D, you're, you're not accounting for non axisymmetric instabilities that could break up the current sheet. Uh, I apologize for my dog, he's a bit impatient. Um, so, so what we did uh, was we, um, uh, we started collaborating with Matthew Liska and Koshik Chatterjee, uh, among others. Um, and we took the hammer code uh, with its GPU capabilities and, and we tried the same thing in 3D. And what you see here, this is a snapshot I'll show a video later, uh, is actually that um, a non axisymmetric current sheet can form that can even be about 15 Schwarzschild radii long. So it's really macroscopic. Um, and it sort of completely blows away the, the accretion disk. So for a short period in time, as long as this current sheet exists, we have a, a really a magnetized magnetosphere that is, however, transient and it's non axisymmetric. As you see on the right here, uh, the disk is still there um, and it's, it's close to the black hole on the right, but not on the left. So what we, what we call this an episodic flaring state because these plasmoids here, and uh, they can cause, uh, they can power strong flares, but they, they only form um, uh, transiently. Um, the way this current sheet forms, as we understand is because the jet is so magnetized in a mad, uh, in a mad simulation that it really pushes the, the, the inflow, the accretion funnel due to, ver to very small scales. In this case, this is ideal MHD. So it really pushes it to a single cell uh, level. Um, there is so much magnetic energy in the jet uh, that that can that can sort of be transferred through the reconnection in this current sheet to to kinetic energy that um, that that these plasmoids can get really hot, as I will show you in the in, in the next slide. Uh, I want to mention that plasmoids only form for resolutions of about five thousand by two thousand by two thousand, and we tried smaller resolution simulations, which are still extremely large. Uh, and plasmoids don't form. So you really need these high resolutions to resolve this high Lundquist number that I mentioned before. Um, and this was only possible with the GPU accelerated uh, hammer code by, by Matthew. Um, so in a video, uh, you will actually see that, uh, that, that this transient phase uh, occurs about every 1500 RG over C or about every 2000 RG over C. Here you saw the first one. Um, just now, but later on, uh, as you can you can follow the red dot here, um, and it shows the the magnetic flux uh, through the horizon. Uh, you can see that the mad state builds up here again, and the mad state exists for a while until here at about seven and a half thousand. Bart, RG one minute. Thanks. Please. At about seven and a half thousand RG over C, we get a flux expulsion, uh, and then you get a thin uh, a current sheet. Um, so what does it look like in 3D? Uh, you see that actually here, I, I just volume rendered all the temperatures that are that are relativistic or uh, above one in P over rho terms. Um, you see that this current sheet is very thin and very, uh, very warm. So it can really power flares. Now we also know from Elliot actually that, um, I'm gonna skip this, um, from Elliot that the actual plasma is collisionless around Sagittarius A star. So we did a, a, a toy simulation of such a current sheet in resistive GRMHD, um, as I've show, shown, you, shown you before, uh, and we reproduced it with GRPIC. And you see that a similar thing happens, but the reconnection rate is 10 times faster in GRPIC. So mm -hmm. on a shorter time scale, larger hotspots can, can form if we actually should take into account the full collisionless nature of the, of the plasma. And th these kind of GRPIC simulations can provide us first principle electron distribution functions that we can use to model radiation in, in global GRMHD simulations. Um, that was all. All right, so I will be clapping on behalf of everyone. And I see Michael has a question, so please unmute yourself or... Uh, well, I was Elliot. clapping. <laughs> I think Elliot has a question. Thanks, Bart, that was great. Um, can you elaborate, one sees these sort of limit cycles of instabilities and flux eruption and ejection um, due to, you know, even at lower resolution due to, you know, Rayleigh Taylor or something along those lines. Are what you see at higher resolution, is it fundamentally different or is just the character of how the limit cycles behave is, is, uh, is a bit different physically? I guess I didn't understand that connection. It, that's a great question. Um, so we did a resolution study and indeed at low resolution, we see, uh, as you say, we see these lemon cycles as well. And we also see the flux drops. The thing is that the flux drop, uh, the rate of the drop actually depends on your numerical resistivity. Um, so if you're in the asymptotic plasmoid regime, then that, then that rate is sort of asymptotic 0 0.01 times the speed of light in, uh, in, in MHD. 
And if you're at lower resolution, it's, it's, it's a higher rate because you have a larger uh, diffusion. So I would say that's the main difference. And that of course is, you can see it visually because this current sheet can get so thin that it forms plasma, plasmoids. Mm -hmm. But I think the main thing in the, flux, in the episodic flux drops is the rate, uh, the rate of the drop. Great, thank you. All right, so thanks for the uh, illuminating presentation, Bart. And we will move on now to the next speaker, and that is Mohammed Shalabi, and uh, hailing from the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam, he will be talking about the plasma physics of horizon scale images of black holes. Uh, thank you, thank you guys for uh, coming to this session. So. Uh, in this short presentation, I will try to share some uh, some thoughts about really how how can how should we we think about like the plasmas at the horizon scale of of uh, a black hole like M eighty seven. So first of all, like uh, just want to emphasize the the nature of collisionless uh, uh, of the plasma near the the near 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 a black hole like M eighty seven. Just like if you think about like the density, the density, the number density near near these objects, let's say at, at five uh, RG, is like ten to the four per cc. And the density, the type of densities that we observe on Earth, where we know that fluid type or MHD type uh, approximation can really macros uh, uh, can really model the macroscopic evolution of of, of such of such uh, fluids is really coming at, at very high density. So if you look at ordering of scales for, if you imagine uh, a fluid with such number densities that like earth magnetic field or at, at some not very relativistic temperature, the typical ordering is that you have that the smallest scale would be the mean free bath for the collision, uh, Coulomb type collision. And then comes that after that, the Debye lens and after that, the Larmor radius. Uh, so this is the Larmor radius if you have some half RG at sub-relativistic uh, velocities. But if you look at the, at, at the ordering of the scale uh, for, for, for plasmas near the horizon M87, it's completely different. And this is what, what, what people have already been emphasizing, the, the nature of, 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 uh, of these plasmas. So for a plasma on Earth, anything that happens on the Debye and and uh, on the, sorry, the plasma scale of the Larmor radius can be really quickly uh, diffused away from by, by this type of collision at a smaller scale. But since the, the, the mean free bar there is larger and the RG is even larger there, what happened there can really impact the momentum distribution of, of these emitting electrons. So it's really like you can just blindly use GRMHT because we know it's not valid. But, but then the question is, it's it's, what, what should we do? How can we model the production of these, uh, uh, these emitting electrons and how, how they dynamically evolve there? So the first attempt would be to do GRMHT. And the real question there is, can we really do a proper job there? And <clears throat> of course you can do nice movies with there, but I will just in this slide, I'll try to argue why you can't really trust these simulations. So basically you have a huge separation of scale. So in a typical big, type simulations, you need to really resolve the plasma frequency if you really want to resolve the microscopic evolutions. And this is, an M87 is something like 10 to the minus seven seconds. You have a huge separation in the temporal scale and also in the spatial scale. So you have the Larma radius there is maybe a few tens of, of centimeters, the divalence maybe a few thousand of, the, of, of centimeters, but the RG is 10 to the 14 or a few times 10 to the 14 centimeters. So huge separation scale. So the, the typical technique to resolve this issue is to bridge scales together by using artificial uh, values for magnetic field or uh, for instance. But, but usually the, most of the simulations that attempt to do that, once they artificially change the values, they also artificially change the physical ordering of these, of these scales. And, and thus you're not really simulating the same physics. Uh, and even if you do that correctly, there is, there is no numerical errors in these big simulations that are basically so far are largely uh, ignored. So if you use typical, uh, typical big algorithm, uh, you have these huge numerical errors. So this is a work that I did with, uh, with every 
few years back, and you can see these, these are the dash curve. This is a typical algorithm, and the black one is from, this is the numerical heating. This is the energy error in your simulations. This was 1D, and the story carries over to 2D. If you do the same thing, the dash line again here is typical numerical big algorithm that people use usually even in GRPEC. And you see these huge numerical errors and probably more interestingly for these, probably once you add magnetic field, the numerical heating is also anisotropic. So you can artificially, because of this numerical heating, uh, you can add also some, some, some instabilities or impact the growth of some instabilities because of just numerical heating. So, so, so to the answer to, the, the, to this question is, of course you can use it to do nice movies, but if you want to really look at the dynamics uh, and the emission of these emitting electrons there, you can't, even if you resolve the scales there, you can't really trust these simulations. So the obvious- Minutes. Yeah. Uh, so the obvious, the, the, the second obvious thing to do is to use extended MHT or a flow type approach. And this is something like uh, uh, Elliot showed on Monday. So basically you add more physics like anomalous resistivity, which mimics some impact of microscopic instabilities or add two fluid uh, or use two fluid uh, global modeling where the temperature of ions and electrons are basically evolving independently. And if you just look at these equations at the equation that you're using for, for these attempts, you can really by just estimating different values of, of uh, of basically terms that you add there, you can really see that these can grow and have dynamical impacts. And but but really, when when you look at, do we expect when you try to think about do we expect different emissions? Do we really expect that using these would greatly impact the distribution of these emitting electrons? And the answer is is really no, because what actually impact the momentum distribution of these uh, of these? You can depending on your imagination, but you can cook up lots of physical scenarios of the plasmas near the horizon. And you can see that most of the instabilities are happening either at the plasma scale or the Larmor radius of, of these electrons. And these are, in these global models are not very, uh, very well resolved. And even if you resolve them, the saturation of some of these instabilities at least depend on wave particle interactions such as nonlinear Landau damping. So even if you resolve them, you don't have the physics there to actually simulate the evolution of, of these instabilities. So, this what this what this argue for is that if you want to really model the dynamics of these emitting electrons, you really need to do that as a subgrid model in these global simulations. Uh, so I, I was thrilled when I saw this nice movie by Elliot Monday, which like you can see that once you you really uh, go to the two fluid approach, you can see really uh, a, a large dynamical impact. But as I expected when I when I thought about this is you don't really get much difference in the emission. So what I propose is, is really- Maybe one more slide or, or two. Yeah, so last slide, yeah. So what I, what I was trying, what I, what I propose to do here or what I'm suggesting here, and this is something I've been, I uh, started with Will East from Perimeter, is basically trying to add these effects as a modeling. So this is a force-free axisymmetric simulations where you can see once you have a curved black hole in, in, in a strong magnetic field and you evolve the system in a force-free in a force-free uh, way, you get these current sheets. And, and, th and this is like an obvious example. This is this is the current sheet where inside the ergo region where the force-free approximation breaks down. So what I did here is basically to take these fields and uh, ask what what a what a Zamos observer, because this is a, an observer that's rotating with these with these curved black holes would see the fields as, and the, the advantage of the Zamos observer is that the, the space time there is locally flat, so you can just make cuts here. And then I devote the ability to really use these cuts to basically reduce the, the force-free currents, let these as species, electron boson species, as with, and with a given choice of basically the ordering of the scale, the Larmor radius to the RG, and uh, basically the magnetization or the skin depth to the ratio of the skin depth and uh, and the larmor radius you really can produce a, 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 you can you can really study the dynamics there by just making these local batches and this is like an ongoing work uh, i have run the simulations not really at the time to to analyze them but with this i will end with my conclusions and uh, uh, i would love to hear some questions
Thanks. All right. Thanks, Mohammed. So one quick question. Uh, anyone? All right, so if there are no questions from Mohammed, uh, then uh, we go to our next speaker uh, and hailing from the Black Hole Initiative at uh, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics is Razie Imami. Uh, please take it away, Razie. Uh, hi, everyone. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's really a great pleasure to talk here. Thank you so much for accepting me. And that's also actually a great pleasure to present some works that we've done, we've done with my great collaborators, including Richa, which is the host today, and Hassan Rusha and Avi Lo. So that's about modeling the positron effects on polarized image and spectra from jet of MAD7. Let me just start with the setup of the actual analysis. We actually, we just use all of the calculation that we've done was just based on the uh, home simulation that was kind of like semi-analytical models, which was the force speedy region of a home simulation with the mad accretion and then A over M of order 92, actually 0.92. And then we just use some fitting formula for basically the magnetic flux, angular speed and gas pressure. And with the rest of the basically formula for the velocity as well. And there are also some parameters that I'll be mentioned later. Also, we assume actually to have a basically synchrotron emission uh, of a non-thermal electron and positrons because we also added the positron in our analysis, which actually have a nearly power law emission and also with the minimum and maximum of the gamma Lorentz factor. So the only difference between electron and positron is that the fraction of the positrons in this power law is not the same as the electron. So the strategy was that we actually remove some of the protons in our analysis and replace them with the positrons, but we kept this actually fraction of a positron to be completely constant during the entire of our analysis as I've been mentioned. In addition, we also assume different emission models, for example, constant beta model, critical beta model, et cetera, et cetera, in which for this example, we use actually the fact that the pressure of the electrons is basically beta times the pressure of the magnetic field. So with that setup, which was based on the home simulation plus the synchrotron emission, we then tried to also propose some models for the actually for the positron creation. There are many different positive, there are many different channels of the positron creation in the basically in the literature that you can actually see some of them here. Unfortunately, I don't have too much time to mention them in detail, but you can also assume that either they're from coming from the stagnation surface or coming from some funnels of the jet. So as soon as we have all of this set up, including the simulation, including actually synchrotron emission, et cetera, we can actually go ahead and just do some modification to GR trans. So it's actually include basically modifying the emissivity absorption for the rotation and for the conversion in which we proposed actually to have the positron fraction in all of them. So that's, and I hope that that's just enough of the introduction to tell you what we exactly did. And now let me actually go toward the basically toward the and um, you know the results of the images and the spectra. So let's start with the imaging black hole imaging, which from uh, top to the bottom we actually consider to change the positron fraction. The beta that was the gas pressure to the magnetic field pressure was just actually constant here. But from uh, up to the bottom we increase the positron fraction. Also the power law index but then not thermal actual electron emission and positron emission is kept constant. So we actually can see that there are many different interesting patterns here. So one of them is that for the ionic plasma case, Q and U that are SOX parameters are scrambling for low positron fraction. They also get actually very regular when you increase the positron fraction. Furthermore, when you go to the pep plasma case, you see that the further rotation completely vanish for the conversion increase but lateral asymmetry would decrease and Q and U also increase. Let's actually proceed toward the basically toward the actually a spectra of the analysis. So in this case, what you actually see is the total uh, I 
the linear and also the circular basically polarization for a constant value of the p that is actually actually higher than what I proposed before. And you can actually see that there are very interesting pattern here. For I, we see that when we increase the beta, they don't converge as higher frequencies, although they are actually very much close to each other as lower frequency. When we go to the when we go to the linear polarization, we definitely see that the different actually lines of the positron fraction would actually line up differently. So it's actually to conclude that the linear and circular polarization are very sensitive to the to having even very little positron fraction. However, the fact is that when you consider higher and higher frequency in the linear polarization, their effects would be completely indistinguishable. In addition, when you go to the circular polarization, because of the Faraday conversion, even in the case of the pep plasma, which means that F is uh, completely equal to one, I see you are seeing that the um, actual circular polarization is not zero. However, the efficiency of the same, basically the efficiency of this further conversion to convert the linear to the circular polarization and thus create a circular polarization would vanish and just decrease dramatically at higher and higher values of the frequency. Next, we can actually ask what would happen when you actually decrease the frequency. So far, I was just uh, completely focusing on the imaging at 230 gigahertz as ESG actually can do it for us. But now let's imagine what would happen when we decrease the frequency. So here is actually what we see for the 86 gigahertz. And you can actually very, uh, very visually see that the jet is extended too much. They are actually scrambling more. The levels of the twist actually increase, but not in order to actually, be, you know, get a better and better comparison. Let me also put the 230 gigahertz and then go back to actually 86. So the difference is very, very visible. And it's actually yeah. very basically giving us a lot of hope that we can basically probe them. So with that note, let me actually go a little bit to the connection to the observation. So in this actually very messy um, table, I'm going to actually show you a lot of different patterns. So bear with me a little bit. Let's actually start with trend in increasing the beta in us. We can actually see from here that when we increase the values of the beta in us, from uh, actually from the left to right, we see that all of the stocks parameters, including the linear and circular polarization, and also actually in terms of the basically in terms of these different observables would actually increase. So that's very interesting. Another pattern that we can actually see is basically the trend when you increase the positron fraction. Let's just take a look at them here from actually from up to the bottom, we are increasing the positron fraction. Again, the trend is that they are going to actually increase all of the linear and circular polarization. Again, we can actually hope that the basically the current or the next actually, you know, basically data from the ESD can confirm them or just like roll them out. And finally, we can also ask what would happen as a trend when you actually increase the value of the P, which was the index of the non-thermal actually electrons. So in this case here, uh, sorry, from actually from top to the bottom, we are increasing the value of the P from 2.5 to 3.5. It's very interesting because we actually see that in this case, the linear polarization would actually decrease. One minute. It here, okay. And then when you actually consider the circular polarization, the pattern is a little bit like, you know, kind of actually less of unknown because that's just like, you can actually first decrease this, but then afterward increase that. But when you consider the absolute value of the circular polarization, it actually just increased. So that brings me to the conclusion of this talk. I hope that that was just like clear, although that was very short talk. So we modeled the effect of no uh, zero positron fraction in emitting the plasma in some semi-analytical fitting formula to home simulation from MAD7, when we consider actually both the imaging and the spectra, we actually saw that in this case, the linear polarization and secular polarization are very sensitive indicators of the plasma positron fraction. And then we can actually see that the positron, the secular polarization, although we would expect rather, you know, except that the further conversion is not there, would actually turn on, although the sensitivity of that in very, very high frequency would actually diminish or just get to zero. So with that note, let me end my talk. And thank you so much for your attention. Again, sorry that that was just very short talk. So I'm happy to answer your question, if any. All right, any questions? Very good.
Feel free to raise your hand or. So I have a question. Um, yeah. What would be a physically motivated uh, range of positron fraction to explore to see some of and potentially see some of these effects? Yeah, that, that's actually a very nice question as we are probing these days. It seems like that the positron fraction that we consider because, because we are actually considering many different parts of the basically parameter space was just like a very three extremal case starting from zero positron to actually complete positron fraction. That was just like electron and positron were just like equal. However, as it turns out, it very might be that not all of these models are kind of like realistic in the sense that it then might be that there are a lot of actually very interesting cases between zero to 0.5 positron fraction. So that would be really, really intriguing. So first of all, actually look at some of the real simulations in which we can just say basically having some semi-analytical estimation of the positron fraction, you know, uh, according to them in terms of actually the efficiency of the pair creation and so on and so forth. And as soon as you are done with that, then you can just like proceed and ask yourself, you know, what would be the real change in the actually in the imaging and also basically in the spectrum. All so right. my, uh, yeah, so my current expectation is that what we are seeing would be something between zero and 0.5 positron fraction. And as you see here, there like, are not- you, We actually yeah. have to go, go. Oh, Okay, yeah, so sure, okay. About, zero to 0.5 is a good range to start looking Absolutely, at. Absolutely, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, so let us now go to uh, Koishi Hirotana from Asia A, describing 2D GR PIC simulations of a black hole magnetosphere. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you please share your screen, uh, Koishi? Or? There you go, um, slideshow mode, slideshow. Yes, thank you. It goes fast. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, if you can do slideshow and then play from start. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my topic will deal with kinetic modeling of two dimensional uh, black hole magnetospheres. Uh, relativistic jets. Um, I cannot see the screen. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm. It is widely accepted that relativistic jets are energized by the release of black hole's rotational energy. For example, MHD simulations have demonstrated the bland Hodonic mechanism, mm, which was originally investigated in a force free magnetosphere. However, uh, at a low Uh, I can't see the screen. So... Uh, we can see it, right? Uh, is you you can't see what your um slides look like. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, however, at a low low enough accretion rate, uh, the advection dominated accretion flow um, emits MEV, MEV photons. However, they cannot um, supply enough plasmas to sustain a force free magnetosphere. In this case, plasma density becomes less than the rotationally induced Goldilocks Julian charge density. In such a charge served magnetosphere, electric field arises along the local magnetic field lines. In this vacuum gap, a portion of the uh, pointing flux, Blanford's neck power, is dissipated as particle acceleration and radiation through pair production cascade. And the stationary Pair production cascade has been investigated more than two decades ago. However, actual pair cascade will be highly time dependent as in the case of lightning. Therefore, to examine the kinetic phenomena, uh, particle in cell simulations are performed recently. Uh, Tel Aviv, uh, Princeton, and Goddard, and Grenoble groups have uh, worked hard uh, on one-dimensional and two-dimensional general relativistic big simulations. And today I'll talk about our new efforts on two-dimensional GR peak simulations. 
and to achieve a long simulation duration and a realistic magnetic field strength, I applied our new code to a Stramas black hole, not supermassive, but we applied a code to Stramas case. In this work, we adopt 10 solar mass black hole mass, heavy electron mass, and radial magnetic field down near the horizon, and very small accretion rate, which is much less than the, much less than the Eddington limit. In MHD, the system of equations is closed by the Ohm's law. However, the Ohm's law breaks down if the black hole magnetosphere, uh, if the accretion rate uh, becomes below the limit, which, uh, well, at this limit, mm, magnetosphere becomes marginally force free, but below this limit, magnetosphere becomes charge starved. In this case, uh, if we compare the collision, uh, collision frequency and the gyro frequency, we find uh, that the magnetosphere becomes highly collisionless in the sense that collision frequency is much, much less compared to the gyro frequency. Therefore, and when we, con when we consider plasma motion, we can neglect uh, the effect of collisions. In another world, we must construct the electric current from the plasma's actual motion, and we must discard the MHD approximation, which relies on the adoption of the Ohm's law. And for example, we, uh, we must incorporate the plasma drift motion and anisotropic momentum distribution to construct the electric current. We thus adopt a particle in cell method and apply our code to stellar mass black hole. In the code, Max's equations and, and the particle equations, equations of motion are solved uh, simultaneously. Now let us move on to our results. First, we find that a strong electric field arises along the magnetic field lines near the event horizon. Two minutes. Uh, radi yes? Two minutes, please. Oh, okay. Uh, radial electric field become positive in the lower latitude and negative in the higher latitudes as described in the right panel. And the charge density is found to exceed the gold lecturian value and the plasma becomes highly non-neutral. And this charge imbalance plays an essential role in the Maxwell equations. Uh, current flows in from the higher latitudes and flows out from the lower latitudes. Because of this current distribution, the pointing flux point radially outwards and the pointing flux maximizes in the middle latitudes. And the black holes uh, rotational energy is extracted via the Blanford genetic process. The extracted energy flux can explain the power of typical uh, black hole X-ray binary jets uh, during low hard state. And it is also found that the outward flux exhibit a flare-like ac activity. And the flux enhancement lasts typically 160 dynamical time scales for tensor mass black holes. And the pointing flux uh, concentrate in the middle latitudes, typically between 50 and 70 degrees from the rotation axis in both hemispheres. Uh, let us finally discuss an implication to the M87 jet. Uh, the uh, pointing flux concentrate in the middle latitudes for mass black holes. If this conclusion holds also for supermassive black hole, uh, the limb brightened structure of the M87 jet may be formed by this enhancement in the middle latitudes. So energy flux is small along the axis and concentrate along the limb. Uh, the MHD analysis uh, revealed that jet begins to collimate outside the outer light surface. And before the collimation, Jet may be nearly radial, particularly near the horizon due to the inertia of the plasmas. If a jet is paraboloidal outside the collimation radius, say uh, R0 and theta naught, then we can relate uh, the downstream position R theta and the, and the collimation um, position R0 theta naught. Can we do one more? Yeah, one more slide, thanks. Okay, thank you. And suppose the magnetic field line at foot point of 60 degrees is brightened. 
then combining our simulation results with VLBI 86 gigahertz observations, we find that the collimation begins at a few times of uh, light cylinder radius. This small distance means that the M87 jet begins to collimate within the radial distance of 24 um, Schwarzschild radii for slowly rotating case and seven or eight times Schwarzschild radii uh, for the extremely rotating case from the rotation axis. We consider it provides a scientific target to MGEHT. So this is, uh, this is our summary. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so any any questions for Koishi? So I guess if there are no questions for Koishi, then uh, we're going to go to Zachary Jals uh, for identifying small scale structure in high resolution images of black holes. Um, great, thanks. Let's see. <clears throat> All right, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Um, all right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Ellis. I'm a student at Harvard. And today I'm going to be presenting on identifying small scale features in high resolution images of black holes. So I'd like to start by identifying the need for high resolution images and why they're so important. Now, we know that many of the most illuminating features of black hole images only show up at extremely high resolutions. So if we take a high res image of a black hole, like the one seen here, we can see some of these features right off the bat. We know that relativistic effects like light bending uh, usually show up in the photon ring and subrings, which appear as a very thin ring on the screen. We also know that there are lots of small scale features in the turbulence of the accretion flow, which is driven primarily by the magnetorotational instability and can be seen in this image out here in the arms of the plasma. And lastly, we know that there's of course lots of small scale structure in the jet, which while too faint to see in this particular image would ordinarily live somewhere out here. So we need high resolution to see all three of these layers of black hole images. Of course, the problem is that it's very computationally expensive to actually ray trace simulations with the required fidelity to see all of these individual features in the entire image. To put this in perspective, the current EHT image library, which is maintained by the University of Illinois, uh, has images that cannot see a lot of these features. And for example, they only have resolution that's capable of resolving the n equals one subring. To resolve n equals two or n equals three, we would need to exponentially increase the resolution of these images, which would be a tremendous computational endeavor for a traditional ray tracing program. There is a potential solution, however, when ray tracing images, if we can identify these sharp features, the photon ring, the turbulent accretion flow, then we can specifically choose to concentrate rays there while leaving the rest of the image relatively sparsely populated with rays. And in doing so, we could effectively increase the resolution without sacrificing too much time. And this motivated the need, the idea of adaptive ray tracing. So over the past year, I've been working on developing an adaptive ray tracing algorithm that does just this. It makes ray tracing faster by concentrating rays in areas of interest on the image. This is a project that I worked on with a number of EHT collaborators, including Ben Prather, Daniel Palumbo, Michael Johnson, uh, George Wong, and Boris Georgiev. Um, and the way we approached this project was we used the ray tracing code IPOL and we modified it to include an adaptive ray tracing component. And then we used the code to ray trace images from the University of Illinois GRMHD library. And in doing so, we had a couple key goals in mind. First, we wanted to develop refinement strategies to isolate regions of interest on the image. And we wanted to make sure that these refinement strategies could be easily implemented in other ray tracing codes so that they weren't just IPOL specific. Second, we wanted to probe the structure of the n equals two and n equals three, three subrings since the current EHT image library is only capable of resolving n equals one. And finally, we wanted to provide insight into the time evolution of small scale features in these simulations. We didn't wanna just ray trace one snapshot and call it a day. We wanted to ray trace whole simulations to track how these small scale features change over time. So the algorithm works in the following way. If we wanna ray trace an image, we start by ray tracing at a very low resolution on a uniform grid. So it may look something like this, where on the right, we show where the rays are being fired on a uniform grid. And on the left, we show the output image. At this very low resolution, 
the image looks quite blurry, but that's okay because this is where the next step comes in. At the next step, we then go back and we refine. So we concentrate rays where the spatial derivatives in the intensity are presumed to be large, uh, specifically large compared to a pair of absolute and relative tolerances. And so where these tolerances are exceeded, we ray trace, and then we interpolate everywhere else using either nearest neighbor or linear interpolation. We can quantify the degree of interpolation with an interpolation fraction. So at this particular stage, the interpolation fraction is zero because all of the pixels have been ray traced and none of them have been interpolated. But this changes as we go up to future refinement levels. So bumping up the resolution to 65 by 65, we're now interpolating over 50% of the pixels and the 49% of remaining pixels that we ray trace are concentrated heavily towards the center where we know we want to increase the resolution. This process then repeats up to another resolution increases by another factor of two, interpolating more pixels and concentrating the remaining rays towards the center. And one more time to reach our desired resolution, in this case, 257 by 257, we're interpolating almost 80% of the rays and the remaining 20% uh, that are actually traced are concentrated towards the turbulent accretion flow and photon ring that we know we want to resolve more clearly. Now we were able to use this code uh, on it for a number of different applications, one of which was subring decompositions. So thanks to a code written by George Wong, we were, were able to actually decompose uh, ray traced images into individual photon subrings uh, that include emission from different components of the photon ring. And with adaptive ray tracing, we were then able to ray trace these subrings at unprecedented resolutions. Um, so in particular, we ray traced a simulation at, 30, at over 32,000 by 32,000 pixels over an 80 micro arc second field of view. Two minutes. And I, in doing so, uh, and so with this particular simulation, um, ray traced at, at this very high resolution, we were able to see the n equals zero, the n equals one, the n equals two, and even the n equals three subring with very high fidelity capable of actually resolving the width and photon ring substructure. And we found that when we stacked these subrings back together, we were in fact able to reproduce the original image now as a sum of n equals one, n equals two, and n equals three, and n zero. A second application came from shifting from the image domain to the visibility domain. We took an adaptively ray traced image at a very high resolution. Um, and if you take a Fourier transform along a horizontal axis, we found that the spectrum showed a very complicated stochastic structure. Specifically, we showed that this is due to n equals zero or direct emission, introducing lots of high power turbulence, MHD turbulence into this image that causes the Fourier transform to appear so stochastic. Um, that's okay though, because we can get rid of this stochasticity by time averaging over many images. And that becomes uniquely possible with adaptive ray tracing because we can generate entire simulations at the, re at the required resolution, but at a fraction of the speed. And so after time averaging over 500M using adaptive ray tracing, we're able to suppress the N equals zero turbulence, which brings a much more clear spectrum back to this Fourier transform. And in fact, the spectrum now matches the predicted visibility uh, spectrum of the N equals one photon subring. The N equals one photon subring uh, should look in visibility space like some, some kind of Bessel function of the first kind. It should have these damped oscillations that we see very clearly after time averaging. And so in this manner, we can learn a lot about the time scales over which accretion flows varies. Vary. In this case, we see that by a time scale of 500M, the N equals zero flux has been dramatically suppressed. The turbulence has been washed out and we can extract the signal of the N equals one subring very clearly. All right, maybe a slide. So, yeah, okay, this is my last slide. Um, so where can we go in the future? Um, now that we have the tools to understand the relativistic signatures that show up at extremely high resolutions, and create pictures like these, there are many directions we can go. We're going to continue to probe the photon ring substructure. Um, and we're, so for example, I'm currently working with Machik Wilgus to examine the frequency dependence of photon subring flux. This is relevant to the NGEHT because we're hoping to extend to different observing frequencies besides just 200, 230 gigahertz. Um, we also want to extend to polarization so that we don't just focus on the unpolarized intensities, and so we may, for example, compare to semi-analytic polarization models, one of which I'm currently developing with Mina Himwich and Daniel Palumbo. Lastly, I'd like to just say that the adaptive code is publicly available as a Zipol. Here's the link to my GitHub if you're interested. 
or you can feel free to email me, zgallis at college.harvard.edu. And I'd like to extend a big thank you to the Harvard SAO and University of Illinois groups um, for their help and support. Um, so thank you so much, and I'd be happy to take questions. All right, Zach. Uh, yeah, questions for Zach. I have a quick question. Uh, very nice talk, Zach. Um, did you manage to also resolve the n equals two, like you did the n equals one ring in your time averaged images, or are you butting against the resolution of the GRMHD simulation? Um, yeah, um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, and that's a great question. So we, we are able to, with very you know high resolution simulations, see some of n equals two. Um, even with adaptive ray tracing, generating 500 M worth of images that are all capable of resolving N equals two is, is still a lot. And it's something that we were able to do um, a little bit. Uh, you can, if you zoom in way out here, you can start to see it. Um, so we did see that, but it's really the N equals one signature that we were able to, to nail down the most. Thank you, very nice work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, and our last speaker uh, from uh, Harvard again is Angelo Ricarte. So hi everybody and thanks Richard. Uh, so if you haven't met me, I'm a postdoc here at the CFA and the Black Hole Initiative. Today I'll be telling you about Faraday effects in models of M87 star. So if you were following the discussion in the first couple of days, there's been a lot of excitement about polarization because we believe it'll be very informative about plasma properties that we need to get a better handle on. In the millimeter, what we observe is synchrotron emission, and this has a very high intrinsic linear polarization fraction of around 70% and a circular of about 1%. And the local magnetic field orientation gets imprinted onto both the linear and circularly polarized emission. Linear polarization ticks are perpendicular to the local magnetic field, whereas the circular polarization is, uh, can be inferred via the right-hand rule and you can get this by just thinking about electrons spiraling around a magnetic field line. Then, as the polarized emission travels through the magnetized plasma to us, it gets further transformed by Faraday effects, which are sensitive to density, temperature, and magnetic field, all quantities that uh, vary by orders of magnitude in models of M87 that we'd like to constrain. First of all, there's Faraday rotation. And as illustrated here in this uh, uh, cartoon from Wikipedia, if you start off with this uh, initially uh, vertically oriented polarization tick and move it through this uh, cylinder of plasma, it'll get Faraday rotated by this angle beta, which is a function of temperature, density, and magnetic field, and also has this lambda squared dependence. And this wavelength dependence allows observers to probe the plasma, get at that physics bit by computing a derivative, what we call the rotation measure, or RM, uh, delta beta over delta lambda squared. And for several uh, low luminosity AGN, including SEJ star, RMs around 10 to the 5 to 6 radians per meter squared have been measured. Uh, for M87, there's an upper limit of a few times 10 to the 5 from the SMA. Uh, but a warning is that in this cartoon, the emission is completely, uh, is a point source and is completely behind this Faraday rotating cylinder. Whereas in the case of M87 star, we expect that the emission and the Faraday rotation should occur co-spatially. And we didn't have a very good handle on this uh, before starting uh, this particular project. So in order to better understand Faraday rotation and uh, signatures on the observable rotation measure, we started off with seven passing models from EHT paper five in uh, the 2019 set of papers. Uh, and then we performed some polarized ray tracing with IPOL uh, for a few different snapshots, as well as different inclinations to get a handle on that effect. Uh, we wanted to probe both MADs and SANES, a variety of spins, and then span uh, this parameter R high, which is a proxy for the electron temperature. So let's start off with this one model first. We've got a MAD, uh, A equals plus 0.94, so highly spinning, and R high of 20, which is a, a modest, reasonable value. Uh, right off the bat, you can see that in this image, which I've color coded based on the rotation measure in an individual pixel, if one were able to resolve this, you can see that there's both positive regions and negative regions, uh, which would imply that the line of sight magnetic field direction is flipping sign. Uh, in addition, there's substantial uh, spatial variation in how strong the rotation measure is. 
And so if you weren't able to resolve the structure at all, say with the SMA, rather than the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, you would get this unresolved measurement that I've written on the bottom left here, minus five times 10 to the four. And as we go forward in time, you see that this uh, spatial variation uh, moves around a lot as this uh, material gets accreted onto the black hole, uh, positive and negative regions appear and disappear. And as a consequence, the unresolved rotation measure can vary by orders of magnitude and flip sign. And so uh, we can see that the emission is certainly not a point source and the Faraday rotator is spatially complex. Uh, so we would need to interpret the rotation me measure carefully. And again, uh, there are substantial uh, uh, variations in an unresolved quantity um, that one would need to think about carefully. Looking more broadly at the set of, of models that we looked at in this work, uh, here I plot uh, the rotation measure as a function of accretion rate. And the reason for doing that is because, uh, as shown as that blue region, an analytic ADAF model is often used to set limits on the black hole accretion rate based on the observed rotation measure. Now, if you look at these, at these models, uh, each point of the same color is a different snapshot of the same model. And the filled circles are positive RM, open circles are negative RM. The dashed horizontal line is the upper limit from the SMA. And the left panel is, the, uh, is an inclination appropriate for M87. You can see that there, Again, a substantial variation by orders of magnitude. And uh, I would be quite reluctant to fit a line uh, to uh, this overall trend here. So we expect significant scatter. Uh, part of the problem we think is that models often assume that a lot of that Faraday rotation gets accumulated at large distances far from the horizon. We found in these models that uh, most of the Faraday rotation occurs uh, below 10 M, uh, particularly for 17 degree inclination. Uh, this is because in these models, we've got this evacuated jet region that's facing us um, instead of, as one would usually assume, just a, a continuous uh, accumulation of Faraday rotation. Mm -hmm. Looking more at that initial model in more detail, here is unresolved RM as a function of time. You can see, uh, again, these substantial variations, no preference of sign. If one takes an autocorrelation function of this time series, you find that it drops below 0.5 in the time between snapshots, which is only 5M. And so for this model, uh, the RM of M87 should vary significantly across one week. Curiously, uh, Sag star has actually exhibited a fixed sign of RM for decades. And this is a common question that I get. Um, so I think maybe that means that the dominant source of Faraday rotation may be at larger distances. Uh, that, uh, so in, in these models, we actually only evolve the uh, radiative transfer equations within 20M, where we think the simulation is converged. Uh, and uh, perhaps what we have in the Sag star case is uh, an external screen on top of the smaller scale variability. We took some uh, cross correlations between various quantities for this model, uh, found that uh, RM and linear polarization are anti-correlated as expected. More Faraday rotation will give you a larger RM and then scramble your linear polarization more. Uh, for this one model, there's still no correlation between RM and the accretion rate, and also no correlation between RM and the circular polarization, uh, as that is due to a different process, uh, what we call Faraday conversion. After working on this project on Faraday rotation, I became interested in trying to better understand this. And uh, this is a, a paper in preparation um, that has passed uh, internal EHT review. Uh, you won't be able to find it online yet. Uh, but one thing that we realized is that the uh, Faraday conversion, which exchanges linear and circular polarization states, is, is sensitive to the global um, geometry of the magnetic field as sampled with these uh, curvy uh, null geodesics. Uh, and the sign of the circular polarization from conversion is sensitive to the twist of the magnetic field. By twist, I mean, if you look at this cartoon where we're looking at two magnetic field lines, from the perspective of the disk, uh, what is the change in the angle of the magnetic field as we move from the far side through the structure to us? And if you think about this and look at this carefully, you, you notice that it's actually opposite on either side of the midplane. We got counterclockwise on top, clockwise on the bottom. This gets imprinted on an opposite sign of the circular polarization that we see here for this edge on viewing angle. So mm -hmm. if, for example, we were looking at said J star edge on, um, one might expect to see positive on one side, negative on the other in circular polarization, which would tell us how the magnetic field is twisted. 
Maybe last slide. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, the polarized emission that we want to observe is, uh, whoops, is sensitive to uh, uncertain plasma properties that we would like to better constrain. Faraday rotation uh, changes the polarization plane. And uh, in our models, it's both, both spatially non-uniform and time variable. Meanwhile, Faraday conversion exchanges linear and circular polarization, and this can imprint the global twist of the magnetic field onto the circularly polarized images. So thinking forward to the next generation EHT, things that I would like to see are large enough bandwidths to be able to create rotation measure map uh, movies, as well as circular polarization images. Thanks, and I'll take questions. All right. So. Uh, um... Let's ask Angela questions, given that uh, anyone is free to go to their coffee breaks uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, and uh, uh, Razi, I see you have a question. Yeah, uh, Angela, very great talk indeed. So I was actually, I, I just had a question regarding to the impact, in the exact impact of product conversion. So are you saying that mm -hmm. Uh, any twist that we may have seen in the magnetic field is coming from the Faraday conversion. In another word, if you turn that off or you go to just some situation in which it's not that efficient, like in very high frequencies, do you expect to have a twisted magnetic field or not? Um, okay, so it's the other way around that the, the twist of the magnetic field is going to impact the sign of the circular polarization. Um, oh. And uh, yeah, thinking about higher frequencies, I was also interested in, in your talk, uh, how you have uh, different slopes of CP uh, for different uh, models uh, that may be related to the fact that the wavelength dependence of a circularly polarized emission is different from that of Faraday conversion. Uh, they have different slopes that maybe we should think about more. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk later. Thank you anyway. All right, I see uh, Koishi has a question. Uh, yes. Well, if the jet region contributes in uh, Faraday conversion, uh, if, the if the composition is electron-positron, for example, Faraday conversion will not appear. So can you use Faraday conversion to infer the matter content of the, in, of the jet? Yes, absolutely. Um, this, this goes back to uh, work going, going back to, I think, uh, the earliest I'm aware of is uh, John Bartle, uh, maybe 1998. Uh, so basically, uh, this, uh, Rosie also touched on this as well. Faraday rotation will go away. Faraday conversion will not. Uh, where, and in addition, the emission of circular polarization will go away. Uh, and if you were to equalize the number of electrons with positrons. Uh, so indeed, this, this should be a powerful probe of, of the uh, content of the plasma. Thank you very much. All right. So thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I'm fine with just leaving this uh, this breakout room open for a, a few more minutes uh, if you want to just discuss and then enjoy your your coffee at your own expense. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Of course, thank you guys. <laughs>